Hey, everyone. Hey, we're here. Hello, we everybody. Here Good to see you. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> I can hardly believe we've been doing this week after week. I know. I think this is the eighth week. I just, who knew? It's such a crazy time. Well, we're really happy to have you here with us today to worship and to give glory to our King and King Jesus. I hope that you're able to enter into worship with us. This really is meant to be. Uh, spiritually, we are one body in Christ, whether we're physically together or not. And um, we're going to symbolize it at the end of our service today with the Lord's Supper. So if you don't have your elements, get them at some point. Uh, again, we'll do it at the end after the sermon. So make sure you have those. Dave, got some things going on you could tell everyone about? Yeah, absolutely. I'm thinking that this is the day the Lord has made, so let us rejoice Amen. and be glad yeah. in it. And uh, so, yeah, there's a few things going on that I want to remind everybody about. On our website, winterberry.org, if you go to mm -hmm. that main page, there are so many different opportunities for you to be able to participate in the life of the church. There's opportunities yeah. to be able to help. And so if you click on one of those buttons there, uh, we'll be in touch with you afterwards. So please do that. Also, another way for us to be together is through 21 days. And so yes. each day at noon, uh, we go Facebook Live with that and just share some thoughts, Andre and myself. And I believe Autumn also uh, shares from 21 days uh, later each evening. Yeah. Uh, so please yeah. take some time to do that. We want to let you know too, we know that many families are hurting out there. Uh, we're hearing mm -hmm. about those who are unemployed. And so we have yeah. a way that we can pray and reach out to those that are especially hurting through something called the Deacon's Fund. So yeah. if you are able to uh, give beyond your normal giving to the Deacon's Fund, that allows us to be able to That'd reach out uh, to you in the congregation. Uh, this is a way that we can care for you during a very difficult time. The other and thing- And you can do that either by writing, yeah, you can write Deacon's Fund in the memo on a check or online, Dave, is that correct? That online you can choose a, a, a drop down button for Deacon's Fund? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. You can do that. People are asking different ways to give and yes, one way is online. Uh, but you can also mail a check uh, to the church, and we will be able to take care of that from there. Uh, and even if yeah. you wanted to drop off something uh, to the church, we have a mailbox uh, right at our office that you can um, put your donation in. So uh, we yeah. would appreciate um, you being able to be generous in that. So I wanted to also share a reason to be uh, joyful. So hold on just a second. Yeah, we got something fun to share, right? Very fun. It's yeah, coming. This oh, is super fun. <laughs> look at what a there are She's many so babies cute. being born at Winterberry, oh, and Isabella was born on the 24th. Oh, I love <laughs> very it. sweet, very cute. Andre and yes. I just absolutely yeah. love the baby. So, Lord Jesus, we <laughs> pray your blessing on this little baby. Amen. We thank you as we yes. remember in Psalm 139 that you knit her in Danielle's yeah. womb. So bless the family uh, oh, and yes, thank Lord. you so much uh, for the great mm. gift uh, that we have for uh, <laughs> the babies. Yes, Lord. Going so to. good. Yes, yeah, so that's, for, that's our announcements for today. Uh, we are going to get going and worship the Lord through music. Uh, oh. Autumn is going to lead us in that along with uh, Paul and Allie Tortland. So let's uh, worship oh, together. Right. Amen. Good morning, Winterberry. It's so good to uh, be with you this morning. Joining together to worship, to fellowship.
Father, it's because of your great mercy that we're able to come to you, Lord, to have a relationship with you. I'm reminded of a verse that says, it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. Father, what other response can we have but to come before you, God, and bow down and pour out our hearts to you, Lord, and tell you that you are King of kings. And pray, Father, that you would make us holy in Jesus Christ like you are holy. Psalm 51, for the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. 
Wash away all of my iniquity and cleanse me from sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the innermost parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all of my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant to me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure, Make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, the song in our hearts this morning was Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. The song is we, we bow our heads, we bow our knees, oh God, come make us humble. That's the song in our hearts this morning and that is the poem, the prayer that we just heard from Psalm 51. And that's our prayer this morning, Lord. We pray that you would speak to each one of our hearts as we allow this beautiful psalm, but also deeply penetrating psalm, may it penetrate to those deeper parts. O oh, Spirit, come make us humble. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In his book, The Power of a Promise Kept, Greg Lewis tells the story of a man named Kurt Stansel. Kurt had been married for 16 years. He had two great kids. He owned a successful investment counseling business, and he was a founding elder at his church. He seemed to have it all together, except for one thing. You see, Kurt was covering up a very serious sex addiction. For years, Kurt had struggled with pornography. It started with magazines. But eventually, it kept getting worse until it turned into visits at the strip joints. Kerb kept repeating a cycle. Maybe you're familiar with this. Guilt and remorse and prayer and repentance, only to find himself back at it again. This downward cycle. Eventually, he found an accountability partner named Stan. Now, at first, Kurt held back, being less than honest about his issues. But when he finally did confess, telling Stan the whole truth, Kurt immediately said he felt a weight lifted and cough of his shoulders. He was on the road to victory. He said this about his experience. He said, I began to understand what shame does. When we Christians try to hide something in the darkness, we, we give Satan incredible license to work in our lives. So the more open I could be, the less of a hold Satan seemed to have. So my question for us this morning is this, for each one of us, are we living 
out in the open, honestly and transparent before God and others, or are we hiding in the dark? Do we have masks on this morning? We're continuing our study of the Psalms today called Light in the Dark. And in our study of Psalm 51 today, the darkness we're encountering is not the physical toll of coronavirus, but the spiritual toll of a more insidious virus, the virus of sin. I've entitled my sermon, Have Mercy, because just like Kurt Stansel, our guilt-ravaged hearts cry out for mercy, but we seldom find it in our performance-oriented, shame-based society. But the good news is that mercy is available for anyone and everyone if you look in the right place, like in Psalm 51. Now, since this is only our second week in the Psalms, let me repeat some of the things that I shared last week that we need to keep in mind as we look at the Psalms to interpret them correctly. First of all, there were three characteristics we went over last week about Psalms. Number one, they're sacred songs. They're directed toward God. They're written for worship. Uh, the word psalm comes from the Greek word samoi, which literally is the plucking of strings with fingers. Now, they're written to be sung. They're songs. Secondly, they're also poems, but not just any kind of poem. They're Hebrew poems. Hebrew poetry is different from what we're used to with rhyming and rhythm. Generally speaking, there's parallelism of thought and lots of symbolic imagery, and that the imagery is what you want to key in on usually. And finally, the psalms are expressive prayers generally ranging from laments all the way to praise and everything in between. That's why we relate to them so well, why I think they're so applicable to this weird time we're in right now during this shutdown time. So with all this in mind, we need to remember then that instead of writing theological essays, no, 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 the psalmists, they're more like painters, painting paintings and pictures. And in light of that, I really like what Grasping God's Word, the textbook that we use to teach Bible interpretation at Winterbury. We do it every other year. I like what it says about interpreting the Psalms. It says, interpreting a Psalm is like moving from New, the New Testament letters, uh, moving from New Testament letters to Old Testament poetry. It's like in Washington, D.C., the mall, going from the Air and Space Museum, scientific, logical, and then all, walking into the National Gallery of Art. And then they go on to say, we can't approach Psalm 51 with the same method that we use in, say, Romans chapter 3. The Psalms don't function primarily for the teaching of doctrine or moral behavior like a Romans 3 does. In other words, what they're saying is we need to allow the Psalms, instead of getting all, you know, ripping it apart like a doctor with a cadaver. No, no, no. We need to let the Psalms move us like we're contemplating a painting and, and let the imagery speak to us. That, that's how we need to approach the psalm. So with that all said, if you have your Bible with you, I'd love you to open up to Psalm 51. We're going to look at a very emotive portrait painted for us by King David. I want to thank my good friend, Mick Collins, for beautifully reading it this morning. First of all, we have a subtitle. For the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Now these subtitles are considered part of the text. So this is inspired. And now last week I said it's best not to connect each psalm with a particular historical situation unless it tells us so. Now this one does. Yet even with that, you just need to know that commentators are split on whether it's it, it really was written right after that situation or centuries later that this is the kind of prayer for a situation like that situation. That's where the commentators go back and forth. There is evidence that it may have been written hundreds of years later after the exile. Um, but I'm going to go with, with historical church, church tradition is that it was written by King David as a song after his infamous affair with Bathsheba. Now, with that said, I'm also aware that there are many of you who may be watching this morning who aren't that familiar with the scriptures and never maybe have read the story. So let me, let me briefly summarize what he's referring to. King David was the greatest king in Israel's history. Now, he had followed the first king of Israel, a guy named Saul, and Saul had failed miserably. David, on the other hand, was blessed by God, and he was doing great. Everything's going great until later in life when he got a bit complacent, resting on his laurels. One day, it said, he went for a walk on his palace roof when he saw a beautiful woman bathing. 
Now, perhaps he turned away for a moment, but lust got the better of him. And he looked back, and he looked back, and he gazed. And eventually, ignoring the tug in his conscience, he sent for the woman and slept with her. And that would have been it in his mind, except she got pregnant. So now what? Well, trying to figure out what to do, he, he recalled her husband, Bathsheba. The woman's name was Bathsheba. Her husband's name was Uriah. Uriah was at the front lines fighting for Israel. So he recalled her to make it look like it was his baby if he came home. But when Uriah came home, he refused to sleep with his wife while his friends were off on the front lines of war. <laughs> Honorable man. That wasn't working. Desperate. David decided to send him back with instructions to the general. Let him die on the front lines. And he does. Whew. Wow, David got away with that, or so it seemed. David then took Bathsheba home as his wife. Thought he was home free. But a year later, a year of covering up his sins, the Holy Spirit spoke to the prophet Nathan and told him what David had done. Risking his life very courageously, Nathan went to David and confronted him with a very dramatic story that turned on its head on David. And at that point, David had a choice as his sin was exposed. He could either follow the road now of his predecessor Saul, continuing his sin and with his power, just put Nathan to death and say he was lying. Or he could finally uncover his sin that he'd been covered up for a year and plead mercy from God. Now, now you got to remember, this is the Old Testament. We got to keep that in mind. Old Testament, Old Covenant. He knew full well that the law of God did not allow any sacrifice. There was no sacrifice for willful sins like adultery and murder. There's no sacrifice he can go to the temple and have this covered over with. David, all he can do is throw himself in the mercy of God. And he decides to do so. Instead of continuing the cover-up, he opens up, confesses his sin, and the record of that confession is here in Psalm 51. So as I asked earlier, and I want us all to be thinking as we go through this, are we living out in the open, honestly, and transparent before God and others, or are we hiding in the dark? You know, we need, need this message today more than we realize. One mental health expert said in a webinar meeting last week, he said this, I'm hearing the porn sites are giving away free memberships during COVID-19 to help just what people don't need. There's a lot of loneliness right now and idleness. And some of us have turned to things that we're ashamed of like David did. Well, I encourage us to come out in the open like he did in Psalm 51. So let's look at it. First of all, Psalm 51 breaks up in three parts. The first six verses are in the poem are a plea for pardon. The next six verses are a plea for purity, clean, you know, clean hands, clean heart, as we sang. And then the last seven are a promise of praise. So let's look first of all at the plea for pardon, the first six verses. David writes, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you're proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I've been a sinner from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place, the secret place. David is asking for mercy from God, and, and he does it in a series of triplets. Verses 1 and 2, we see the first triplets. He describes his wrongdoing with three Hebrew words. He says, he says, blot up my transgressions, the word pesha. That means a crossing, it's crossing a forbidden, uh, like a boundary or, or border that's been set. It's rebellion against authority. Then he says, wash away my iniquity, the word awan, which, mean, which means perversion or you know, that which is our natural sinful bent that we tend to do, crookedness. And then he says, cleanse me from my sin, the word hatat, which is missing the mark like an archer's uh, target, falling short of the standard. These three Hebrew words cover the Hebrew concept of wrongdoing, of what we call sin. What David is, by, by using all three of those words, what David is saying is there's nothing I haven't done. I'm, I'm completely guilty. He, he's not absolving himself in any way. 
So what we have here is the first step of confession, which is owning our sin, owning it. You know, we're, we're very much in a, a victim mentality society. It's always looking to blame others for the choices that we make. Now, I'm not saying that terrible things don't happen. They do. But if we're ever going to get anywhere, first thing we need to do is at least own our part, own our own poor choices, our own sin. David makes no excuses here. He owns what he's done and he calls it what it is. And if you notice in verse four, he says, evil in your sight. He doesn't water it down in any way. He agrees in verse four then and in five that God is justified, justified in judging him, proved right in judging him, right? He's no longer seeking to cover up his sin. He is exposing it. Remember, this is a psalm that would have been sung by Israel. It's publicly exposed. He's owning it. He's seeking God's forgiveness. Again, let me ask each one of us as you're sitting there in your living room, wherever you might be in your car, outside, are you living out in the open and honest and transparent? Are you hiding in the dark? Listen, you can't cover up this, your sin. It's going to come out. And the first step, the healing, is stepping into the light and out of the darkness, will you? Well, David does. And he does, and, and he pleads for mercy in verse one based on another triplet. Notice how he says, mercy, unfailing love, great compassion. He's asking for mercy, not on his own goodness, but on according to God's unfailing love, great compassion. That word there is so important, unfailing love. The, the Hebrew word is chesed, chesed. It means it's used 249 times in the Old Testament as it's used here, which usually means loyal love. It's also translated kindness, favor, loveliness, loyal love. It speaks to a special relationship, a covenant, like almost a marriage type relationship between Israel and her God, Yahweh. In other words, David is appealing for mercy, not on the basis of anything in him. He's not saying, hey, you know, I just had a bad day. I'm not such a bad guy. That's not what his basis is. His basis of appeal for mercy is God's kindness. He's on the basis of God's promise to be faithful to him. Lord, I've blown it. But Lord, on the basis of your faithfulness in the relationship, that's what I'm pleading for mercy on. His confidence is on himself. It's in God. I love Autumn prayed in the worship from Romans chapter two, where it says, your kindness leads us to repentance. That concept Paul is using there, kindness, it's chesed. Your faithful love is what leads me to repentance. It's you. I have no hope apart from your faithfulness to your promise to be my God. That's the only hope I have. I have none of myself. That's what he's asking for here. And his request is bold with another triplet. Look at the three things he asks for in verses one and two. Blot out, wash away, and cleanse all of this gunk. These three verbs are very rich in imagery. The blot out verb, it stands for when it, it, it was used of someone when they would wipe a scroll clean. Wash away referred to uh, the, the launderer's soap. And back then there were no washing machines. Think about how long and how hard the work was to clean your clothes back in that time. And then cleanse is, referring, is a word used for ritual cleansing in the temple from diseases like leprosy so people could worship God again. Again, David is fully aware of the extent of all that he's done, and he realized he needs full mercy, full cleansing, everything. It's, this is just not a little repair here. He's well aware of how much he has sinned against God, as he summarizes in verse 3, where he says, For I know my transgression, and my sin is always before me. An entire year, David had concealed his adultery and murder. An entire year. In Psalm 32, he says, when I kept hit, sin hidden, it was like tearing me apart. Right? And it was always there in front of him. And don't we experience the same? Honestly, when we do something wrong, doesn't it gnaw at our conscience? Right? We just can't forget, oh, how did I do that? And then he says, verse 4, against you, you only have I sinned. Well, what about Uriah? <laughs> He's dead. Bathsheba. And others, he's sinned against them too, hasn't he? Yes, he has. And, and, and that's the, what he's saying here is at the end of the day, at the end, of, yes, he sinned against them. He's not saying he hasn't, but what he's saying is at the end of the day, all wrongdoing is ultimately against God. Why? Because without God, there would be no standard of right or wrong. And if there is no standard, if there is no God, there are no standards. Go do what you want. There's no sin, there's no right or wrong. But if there is a God, then there is right and wrong. And if there is a God, all sin is essentially against 
him. Because when we sin, when we do wrong, what we're basically saying is the heck with you. We're basically saying there is no God. It's an offense against God. And this sinful state of ours, our tendency to live our own lives on our own, it's nothing new, is it? As he says in verse five, surely I've been sinful from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You, you teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Actually, the Hebrew there could be you taught me wisdom. Remember, this isn't Romans, okay? David is not making a theological statement about the doctrine of original sin which is what this sounds like. And I'm not saying it's against that doctrine. It's just not what's in his mind. What he's trying to do with these two verses together, look at them together. They're about the inmost place, going back to the womb. It's an image he's painting. With these two verses, he's, that he's saying that God's been teaching him the right way from the very beginning. From the very beginning, God taught him the right way, and yet he's chosen otherwise. In other words, what he's saying is he has no excuses from the very beginning. He's been going away from the wisdom of God. He, he, he says, I can't plead ignorance. It's not like I didn't know what I was doing. What this means is that when we sin, it's not because we're just having a bad day or because we're, we're idiots. It's because there's a fundamental flaw or weakness in our human frame. I like how one guy put it. This is very important. He said, many prayers for help say, change my situation so I may praise you. This one says, change me. I'm the problem. Once again, in these verses, David is taking total ownership of his sin and asking God to forgive him. Are we all willing to do that? Are you willing to take ownership and stop passing blame? Are you willing to look at your own choices? Are you willing to come out of the darkness into the light? But that's not all he's asking for, just to pardon me for my sin. In the next six verses, he asks for something deeper in light of this fundamental inner flaw He's asking for something deeper. Cleanse me with hyssop and I'll be clean. Hyssop was a bridge that was used in the temple to take blood or water and sprinkle on people to, to make them clean and make them, you know, water, to wash them clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you've crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Oh, do you hear his cry? See, in this section, David is asking not only for the removal of his sin, but for the addition of life and joy. He wants to not just have something taken away. He wants to have something added. Make me whiter than snow. He says, I've never sinned in the first place. And notice another triplet there. Uh, verses 8 and 9 where he says, uh, verses eight, verse 8, joy, gladness, rejoice. Another triplet. He wants to just, he wants to go beyond just being forgiven. He wants to have joy again. Because, because isn't this true? Have you ever received, for, someone said they forgave you, but then, you know, you were stupid and did something and you just, the joy just isn't there. You almost feel like you don't have a right to be joyful. How can I just get forgiveness and then be fine? And so we keep beating ourselves up, you know, for the stupid thing that we did, but not David. He's got so much confidence in Yahweh's kindness and in, in the fullness of his, of his forgiveness that he's asking for the moon. Don't just cleanse me, Lord, renew me. Hide your face, he says. Hide your face from my sins. In other words, he's like, you know, like as if they never happened. Just forget them. You know, if we're honest, we have trouble forgetting what people have done to us, right? We say we forgive them, but we never really forget. And there's always a little thing, they're not God. Thank God that's not how he forgives. When he forgives, he, he forgives as far as the east is from the west. He turns his face away from our sin. Wow. And then in verse 10 comes the really powerful request. Look what he says here. Create in me. A pure heart, oh God. I think about the old Keith Green song, Create in me a clean heart. The word create here, I had no idea, is so powerful. It's the word bara. It is the word used in Genesis for when God created the world out of nothing. Look at this word is only used in the Bible of God. Only God can create from nothing. We can renew things, you know, redo a chair, but this is creating from nothing. Only God can do this. And David says, God, you, you need to give me a brand new heart. He doesn't want just a reformed heart. He wants a transformed heart, a brand new one. Make it new. 
so that, so that I won't fall back into where I've been. This new heart is actually promised by the prophets that Messiah is going to bring it to us. And then it was delivered by the Messiah himself, Christ, and his sacrifice on the cross. The only reason God can forget our sin in the end is because it's already been paid for, my friends. That's why we don't have to, to just, just you know, let our sins define us. Christ paid for our sins. But we have to acknowledge that he paid for our sins. And if we trust in Christ and what he did at the cross, God says, I'll give you a new spirit and a new heart. A spirit and heart that loves God and seeks him. Here's how the Apostle Paul summarizes it very succinctly. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is trusted in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. A new heart is what we need if we're going to be transformed and not just reformed. And it's available through faith in Christ. Now, of course, you could say, what, well, Andre? This is David. This is Old Testament. This is way before Jesus. Yet we see him crying out to the same father. It's the same God. God hasn't changed Old Testament to New Testament. He is merciful. And he's always been. He's merciful to those who honestly seek him with a humble, contrite heart. And an imperfect David does just that. David asked God not to cast him from his presence or take his spirit from him. Again, this is not a doctrinal statement about the presence of the Holy Spirit. None of that. It's an image. I like the way Robert Alter translated it. In his translation, he says, do not fling me from your presence. And, and that's a good translation because the word there, the verb is a very strong and violent one. David is probably thinking of, of King Saul. Remember I told you about him, the king before David who just walked away from God? And it says that God removed his spirit. He no longer had the favor of God. He no longer had the joy of God. And he, he just walked away. David doesn't want to go down that road. David is willing to humble himself like Saul wasn't. He is willing to own his son like Saul wasn't. He is willing to come out into the light and, and, and humble himself. When we do, God restores the joy of our salvation. You, you can't lose your salvation because it's from God, but you can lose the joy of your salvation. And repentance and humility brings it back if we trust in God. He will give us a willing, you know, he says, give me a willing heart, a willing spirit to sustain me. This spirit fuels our pursuit of God. In this entire section, David has gone beyond just asking for pardon. He's now asking not only forgive me, but now cleanse me and give me a brand new heart. So I'll go on home. He's asking for purity, a new heart. Have you done that? Have you asked God for a new heart? Have you, have you, have you humbled yourself before him and come out of the dark into the light? Please do. Well, he's going to need that heart in order to fulfill the promises he makes in the final section. In the last uh, seven verses, he makes four promises to God. And he's, what he's basically saying is, God, if you would do this for me, it's not like I, I'm going to pay you back. It's more out of gratitude. With this new heart, this is what I would do. First of all, verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your, way, your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Promise number one, David will actively tell others the wonders of God's forgiveness, even for someone like him. Verse 14, save me from blood guilt, oh God. He's probably thinking about Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, who he had murdered. Save me from blood guilt, oh God, the God who sa saves me. My tongue will sing of your righteousness. My, oh Lord, open my lips. There's parallelism there. And my mouth will declare your praise. Promise number two, praise. Think about it. I don't know about you, but when I'm under conviction of sin, it's hard to praise. You feel awkward even in worship. You feel like a hypocrite. He, look, at shame has silenced David's tongue over the last year. Only God can free it. I'll praise you, Lord. Verses 16 and 17. You do not delight in sacrifice or I bring it. You don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. That's what we sang this morning. Promise number three, transparent honesty before God and others. God, I'm not only actively tell us about you, I not only praise you, but I promise I will be open before you. Honest. See, God's not interested in our obedience in and of itself because lots of people do the right things with the wrong heart. You can even do things like go to church, give generously, read your Bible, do all kinds of good things, but it's your, the heart he's looking for. He wants our hearts to be his. And, and that means honesty because he knows what we're feeling. 
He wants us to be honest and transparent. At the end of the day, the goal isn't about being better people, moralistic. At the end of the day, it's about being his. At the end of the day, it's about him. He wants our hearts. And finally, verses 18 and 19. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. We be meaning build up the walls of Jerusalem. There's a parallelism, Zion and Jerusalem, same city. Then there'll be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Promise number four, David will lead God's people rightly. Look at if David the king, what he's saying, if, if David the king gets right with God, it's going to end up blessing the whole city. And then their offerings are going to be pleasing to God, everything they do in the temple. See, he realizes we don't live in a vacuum. Everything David does is going to affect the people he leads. So let me summarize again these four promises out of a heart of gratitude for God pardoning and purifying. David says, my response, Lord, to this would be, number one, to, I want to actively tell others about your forgiveness. Number two, I will enthusiastically worship you. Number three, transparent honesty before you and others. And then number four, I will lead God's, I, I will do what you've called me to do to bless others. Remember, David realized he can do none of these things unless he receives pardon and purity from God first. The same is true for us now. We can't just serve God or go live for him apart from his forgiveness and empowerment. And the first step, as I said, is confession. I love how John puts it in 1 John 1. He says this, if we claim to be without sin, <laughs> we're in the dark. We deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. We're in the dark. But if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful. See, there it is, hasid and just. And will forgive us our sins, pardon, and purify us from all unrighteousness, purity. Are you willing to confess your sin right now? Own it. If you are, confess them even right now. Trust in God's faithfulness. And he will pardon you, not because you're, you're a good person, and nothing to do about that. It's because of what Christ did on the cross. He will forgive your sins. And more than that, he will give you a new heart and purify you so you can serve him with joy and gladness. So will you be open? Will you continue to live in the dark? There's a book I really love. It's called A Scandalous Freedom by a guy who was a pastor for many years, Steve Brown, radio uh, uh, broadcaster. A Scandalous Freedom. And in this book, Steve tells the story of a Christian woman he knew who fell morally. She slept with her boss, a married man, overcome with guilt afterwards. She finally went to Steve, her pastor, and confessed it. And he led her in a prayer of forgiveness. And then he added one more thing. He said, I think you need to go confess your sin to your boss. What, she asked? I can't do that. Why not, Steve replied. He already knows you're a sinner. Why not tell him about your Savior? Well, reluctantly, she went. And she said this. The night before last, I betrayed my moral standards. That was horrible. But I did something even worse. I betrayed the one to whom I'm committed, who has always loved me. And I didn't even mention him to you. At that point, the guy was probably thinking there's some boyfriend or fiance out there going to beat him up or something. But he, she went on. My betrayal was a betrayal of one who loves me without condition. And even when I've betrayed him, will forgive me and will let me go. I'm not going to sleep with you again because of him. His name is Jesus. And I want you to listen while I tell you about him. And then she shared the gospel, the good news of forgiveness through a kind God and the sacrifice of Christ. And believe it or not, true story, he actually confessed and repented right there and accepted Christ as his Savior too. So how about you? you come out of the dark. Would you come out of the dark this morning into the light? Like You can go straight to God. But it's so helpful to have a Steve in your life or a Nathan in your life where you can hold your accountable or someone you can go to a safe person and confess what the Bible says. Confess your sin to each other. Pray for each other so you may be healed. I encourage you to think about that today or the next few days. Well, finally, what about David? Did God answer his Psalm 51 prayer? Later on, David wrote this in Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. In other words, honest transparency. Let's come out of the dark, friends. We have a kind God ready to give us pardon and purity. 
if we'll just be honest and transparent with him. Father, I thank you for this time in your word. And I pray, Lord, I, I'm, I don't know who's hearing this, but I pray, Holy Spirit, in the moment that they hear this, that you would speak to their hearts. And if they need to come out in any way that they would and know it, it's safe before you. Because Christ has already died for their sin. They can come before you and receive forgiveness and receive purity and be transformed. I pray people would do this no matter where they are this morning. Help us to be open and honest and walking in the light with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please reach out to us if you pray a prayer along those lines. And now we're going to wrap up our morning by coming together and celebrating the elements that remind us of how and why we're forgiven. God bless you. Good morning, Wittenberry. My name is Benjamin Levine. It's my pleasure to be serving as a first-time elder here at the church. And this is actually the first time I'll be presenting communion, and it happens to be done virtually. Today's message comes from Psalm 51, and I'd like to focus on verse 17, where God says he desires a sacrifice of a broken spirit, a broken and repentant heart. He doesn't despise that. In fact, he invites it. Too often we think we need to come to God feeling that we're worthy to be in front of him because he's holy. When in fact, God wants the opposite. He desires a repentant heart, one that is broken, one that has confessed to him everything that is wrong with us. And this is what David is proclaiming in, in this psalm. And this is what God desires too. God doesn't want our pride. He doesn't want us to be boasting in ourselves. He wants our brokenness. He wants our repentance. He wants us to unload what is keeping us from having a rich and right relationship with him. And we're thankful because he has blessed us with the way to do that, which is through Jesus, his son. And that is what we are commemorating here today with communion, that Jesus represents God's willingness to break himself, to break himself so that our relationship with him can be restored. And I'm so thankful for that. So let's read from 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread and eat together. Paul continues, in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you desire a broken and repentant heart. It's your way of unburdening us, Lord. When we confess what is wrong in our lives, what is wrong in our relationship with you, it opens the way for us to have full communion with you to have a richer relationship with you. And I'm so thankful for that. On this day, Lord, we pray for the church, not just Wittenberry, but for the churches in your kingdom as we navigate through the coronavirus pandemic. Your purposes, I'm sure, will be revealed. They are much better, richer, greater purposes than we can imagine. Help us during this time, Lord. Be patient with us. Walk with us through this valley. And we are thankful that we need not be perfect. We need not be boasting of our pride or of our worthiness in front of you. But we, meet, we, we need to just confess ourselves, our sins, and come to you broken and repentant. Because you fix us, Lord. You repair us and you heal us. And I'm thankful for that. We proclaim this day for you, Lord, 
and we are thankful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, Dave. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we're really grateful for hey, that. Dave. We're grateful to be able to join together. And we uh, appreciate sharing the Lord's Supper together. And thank you again. God bless you. Andre, did you have something you wanted to share? Yeah. Um, I just, I know Keith Green songs on my heart. Can I just want to close with it based on where we've been this morning? If you know it, sing it with me, but there is a redeemer, Jesus, God's own son, blessed lamb of God, Messiah, holy one. Thank you, oh my father. For giving us your son and leaving your spirit till the work on earth is done. Thank you for being our Redeemer, Lord. Amen. Peace with you all. We love you.